Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Concussion Doc, episode 81. I am your host, Dr. Cameron Marshall. Today's episode is a question that we get frequently from patients. Um, I also see it frequently on our practitioner groups and practitioner channels, and so it's something that is a common question for many patients, and that is flying flying after concussion. Is it safe to fly after a concussion? Should I be worried about flying after a concussion? Should I cancel my trip? Um, these are all questions that people have typically after they get a concussion injury. And so I figured I would do an entire episode dedicated to flying and other questions that get asked about altitude. Sometimes people want to go, um, you know, on a ski vacation. And although if you're suffering from a concussion, you're not going to necessarily want to ski, but you might want to at least go to the resort and that might be at some significant altitude and you might be worried about that. So um, I'm going to start off with some background on altitude and how altitude can affect our physiology. And I'm going to use that to um, you know, make the case for how altitude might affect somebody with a concussion. Now, this hasn't been heavily studied with respect to concussion, so keep in mind that the evidence on this is still fairly minimal, but from what we do know, we can um, get a little bit of insight into answering the question. So first off, what does altitude do and how does it affect us? Altitude sickness or acute mountain sickness as it's also called uh, can happen at altitudes generally between 8 and 10,000 feet and it usually happens when there's a rapid ascent. So if you're going up very rapidly uh, and or you you know you take off from somewhere and you land at something that has a higher altitude, you, that, that would maybe be considered a rapid ascent and you don't have much time for acclimatization. Um, as you go up in altitude, there is a, a reduction in the amount of oxygen concentration at those levels of altitude. Now, this affects different people differently. So people sometimes are more susceptible to this. So about 20% of the population will start to uh, experience mild symptoms of altitude sickness like headaches, nauseousness, lightheadedness, vomiting um, around 8,000 feet. So that's still the minority, about 20% of people will start to experience it at about 8,000 feet or higher. Once you get up to about 10,000 feet of altitude, uh, about 40% of people may start to experience the symptoms, mild symptoms of um, acute mountain sickness. Usually acute mountain sickness is a very rare form of this. Uh, if you just stick at the same altitude that you're at for uh, about 24 to 48 hours, typically the symptoms will resolve as you acclimatize to that altitude level. If you go higher from that and you go up too rapidly, you can create really significant problems that can actually be fatal, such as um, cerebral edema where you get swelling in your brain, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And you can also get pulmonary edema where you get swelling and fluid buildup in your lungs, and um, uh, it can create all sorts of different hypoxic symptoms like confusion, disorientation, and loss of consciousness. Um, which often happens to hikers that climb very high heights like Mount Everest. Um, there's an there's a, there's a area of Mount Everest where um, a lot of people end up dying because of um, getting into that hypoxic state. So acute mountain sickness is a rare form of that, um, and that's the mild symptoms, like I said, headaches, dizziness, nauseousness. Um, typically happens above 8,000 feet. Symptoms will uh, come on generally after about 6 to 10 hours at that altitude. So now keep this in mind when flying, right? Not many flights are longer than 6 to 10 hours unless you're flying internationally or overseas. So if you're just flying, you know, coast to coast even, typically that's about a four and a half, five hour flight. Um, so you're not even at altitude high, long enough for that to happen. So keep that in mind with flights, okay? That's going to be important. Symptoms typically come on six to 10 hours after getting to that altitude. And if you stay at that altitude and acclimatize, symptoms usually dissipate 24 to 48 hours. If they're not dissipating, the recommendation is to actually reduce your altitude. Uh, the recommendation also, if you're like climbing, is actually to sleep at a lower altitude than where you got to so that you're acclimatizing and also sleeping um, lower. Okay, cerebral edema when you go up to, when you ascend really, really quickly up to very extreme heights, so like 15,000 feet, like getting way up there, um, climbing very, you know, high mountains. Basically, when the oxygen levels get really, really low, you're, you have capillaries, 
So you have blood that flows from your heart through arteries and arterioles and things, and they make their way down to capillaries. At the capillary level is where oxygen exchange happens with tissues. After the capillary, then it's venous return. So basically, capillary is kind of the end of the road. That's where your oxygen um, uh, transmission tends to happen, where you're delivering oxygen nutrients to the tissues. If you get, um, if that becomes more permeable, you can get fluid that leaks out from the blood. So the fluid that makes up your blood, the water content in your blood, if the, that capillary layer becomes uh, more permeable, you're going to get fluid that actually leaks out from the blood into the tissue surrounding it, which can cause what's called edema, which is swelling in the area. You'll see this in people that have congestive heart failure, where their lower legs will swell um, because they're not getting good venous return back up to the heart. So this creates a back pressure where you're going to get swelling in the tissues um, where that capillary bed is pushing water out. With... Um, really high altitudes, your capillaries get more permeable. So you start getting swelling, excuse me, into the tissues um, where those capillary beds are. So in the brain, you're going to get what's called cerebral edema, where you get fluid that leaks into the brain tissue, causing swelling of the brain. In the lungs, you're going to get swelling of the lung tissue and cause fluid building up in the lungs, which is pulmonary edema. Okay, you can also get swelling of the face and bulging of the eyes and all these types of things that happen at altitude. And these obviously can be very, you know, significant and these can cause, you know, permanent brain damage or, or death. Now this is at very high altitudes without acclimatizing and going up too fast. So just keep that in mind that at high, high altitudes, you get brain swelling. And they've done studies on people where they'll bring them up to a high altitude and they'll test them on their cognitive function. And just being at high altitude and creating that kind of cerebral edema, you start to not be able to concentrate well and your cognitive scores go down. So this very much looks you know, similar to concussion where there's cognitive issues at high altitudes. And even if you look at the symptoms of just acute mountain sickness, which happens at lower altitudes, you get dizziness, fatigue, nauseousness, vomiting, headaches, a lot of the same symptoms that might be attributed to concussion, right? So just because somebody's had a concussion, if they start to experience the symptoms of mountain sickness, they might feel that it's because of their concussion, but it actually might just be because of their at being at altitude, okay? So this is where concussion becomes confusing because it overlaps with a number of different things. All right, so does the same thing happen with flying? So acute mountain sickness happens over 8,000 feet, generally over 10,000 feet for, for the majority of people. Flying the cabins of aircraft, even though you're flying at 35,000 feet, you're not breathing oxygen at 35,000 feet. You're, the cabin is pressurized and it's equivalent to about um, between five and uh, 9,000 feet. Typically, the average is about 7,000 feet. So air cabins, where you sit in the airplane, are pressurized to about 7,000 feet. So you're, you're below the level for most people for having acute mountain sickness, but sometimes they're pressurized for 9,000 um, and over. I'm not sure why they would have fluctuations in that, but apparently there's a range that they go with. So... Technically, you can get the symptoms of acute mountain sickness on longer flights. Remember, six to 10 hours is typically when the symptoms set in. And if you're on one of these planes that has a higher um, uh, threshold for pressurization where it's at 9,000 feet and it's a longer flight, you could theoretically start to develop some of the symptoms of you know, headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, and that type of thing. But you're also those are going to go away as soon as you descend back down upon landing. So... Um, even though, yes, you may have some increase in symptoms with flying, uh, those are likely to go away upon landing. So um, no real kind of risk there. Now, how does this affect concussion? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is concussion susceptibility. Because altitude can cause your brain to swell slightly, some researchers started thinking maybe this is protective. So they started studying the concussion risk at altitude versus concussion risk at sea level to try and see because if the brain swells slightly within the skull, maybe 
there's going to be less movement of the skull, less sloshing around of the brain inside the skull, and maybe you could have some sort of protective effect of the brain. Um, now, the research on this so far, there's been uh, about a handful of studies that have been done on this. There's been studies done on NFL football, NCAA football, and a variety of high school sports. And there was a systematic review and meta-analysis that was done in 2016 um, that found that the research on this was mixed. And so far to date, there is no, quotes, there is no clinically relevant association between altitude and concussion risk. So it doesn't seem at this point with the research that we have that we have enough information to make uh, a determination one way or another. Um, so right now, we don't know. More research needed on that. Now, let's get into flying if you already have a concussion injury. There was a study done looking at NHL players, so National Hockey League players, professional hockey players, that had a concussion during a game that while they were on the road or where they flew within six hours of the injury. So you get concussed in a game, often teams will fly to the next place they're going the night after that game. So they'll have a game, the game's ending at 10 p.m., they'll get on the plane, they'll be out of there and flying by 11, 30, 12 at night, and they'll be off to the next, the next location that they're going to. So this particular study that was done a number of years ago looked at NHL players who flew within six hours of being concussed. And what they found was players that flew within six hours of being concussed missed on average 30% more games than players who didn't have to fly after their concussion injury. So potentially in the very acute stages after concussion, there could be some sort of harmful effect of air travel. This is very acute and this is a unique population. Not many people are flying six hours after getting concussed unless you're playing professional sports. A more recent study looked at NCAA athletes. This was in 2019, published in October. Um, there, there hasn't yet been a full publication of this particular study. This was presented at the 2019 Sport Concussion Conference, and it was published in the journal Neurology. Um, and the author's name is Sharma. Sharma and colleagues compared 165 college athletes who flew within 31, a mean of 31.8 hours after their concussion. So a little bit longer than the NHL study, but not that much longer. Basically a day and a half uh, was a typical time period. Um, and they compared it to 2,200 athletes who did not fly after their concussion injury. And they found no differences between the groups, so this is also a larger sample size, no difference between the groups on days to return to full play, no difference between the groups on days from injury to starting the return to play initiation, so starting to be able to exercise, no difference there, no difference in the duration of concussion symptoms, so how long they experience concussion symptoms, and no difference in the amount of time it took them to return back to full school participation. Um, so basically, no difference, and there was no difference depending on how long the flight was. So even if they were tra traversing multiple time zones, it still didn't make a difference between those who flew and those that didn't fly. So although the NHL study shows that in the very acute stages there might be an increase in time loss, uh, this study shows that even after a day and a half, that basically has been diminished down to nothing. All right. So their conclusion was airplane travel... Uh, airplane travel early after concussion did not significantly affect recovery or severity of concussion symptoms in college athletes or cadets. Further studies are needed to investigate possible effects of flying more acutely after injury. So again, calling for more research to study earlier flying after a concussion injury. Now, a lot of people that watch this and ask these questions are typically more chronic. These are our PCS, our persistent concussion symptom patients. There's only been one study that we were able to find that's been done, and it was published in December. And again, we couldn't get the full study because it was a conference presentation that only has an abstract publication. This was published by Aura and colleagues, A-U-R-A, -A, Aura and colleagues, in December of 2019. So basically a month, about six weeks ago. They looked at ocular motor deficit, so eye movements. They looked at saccadic eye movements. Um, you know, examining the eyes and watching things move and having these like skipping effects. And they compared 
people with chronic concussion, and they didn't give a time frame for how long it was, but people with chronic concussion versus um, healthy controls, and they compared them using hyperbaric oxygen so that they could play with the altitudes based on pressurization and oxygen levels within the chamber. And they would test them on these eye motions. So they had three conditions. Condition one was what they call normoxia, meaning like surface level, sea level oxygen. Then they had hypoxia, which was low oxygen levels and equivalent to 13,000 feet of altitude. Now, this is basically double what planes fly at. So it doesn't really fit, but it's the closest we could find. So really, really high altitudes. And then they compared them at altitude, but also after they brought them back down after that, what the recovery was like and what the differences were. So what they found is between concussion, chronic concussion, and um, healthy control, there was no difference at norm oxia. But once they went to the hypoxic environment at 13,000 feet, there became a significant difference. When they brought them back down to sea level, there was still a significant difference and the concussion group took longer to normalize. So they maintained ocular motor dysfunction even when they got back down that lasted longer than it did for the healthy control population. So it seems that at very, very high altitudes, concussion patients may be affected more so than uh, patients that are normal healthy controls. Now, how does this affect your ability to fly? Well, we don't know because 13,000 feet is a lot higher than 7,000 feet, right? It's almost double. So um, in terms of its ability to affect flying, I'm not really sure. So the conclusion based on what we have, which I like I said is very limited evidence, at very high altitudes, concussion patients may be affected. In terms of flying, it seems like there may be some issues in the very, very acute stages within a couple hours after getting your concussion, but so far nothing to indicate any issues with flying beyond that initial six hour window. Okay? So if you have chronic PCS and you're worried about flying, I wouldn't be so worried about it. The other question that we get is turbulence in the air. Should I be worried about turbulence? The answer is no. People, especially patients with concussions, are always worried about the little bumps and things that they do. You know, I, oh, I bumped my head on a counter or I, I hit a speed bump and, and I think I got another concussion. That is not enough force requ that's required to cause a concussion injury. So any of these little bumps are not causing concussion injuries. To put this in perspective, the threshold for concussion, because what has to happen with concussion is your brain has to stretch where there has to be the nerves of your brain, the, the, the cells of your brain have to stretch enough to create an ion exchange to create depolarization and this kind of metabolic cascade that happens with concussion. So you need a tremendous amount of force. 70 to 120 Gs has been identified in things like football to cause that concussion injury. So it's a lot of force, okay? To put this in perspective, typical turbulence ranges between 0.8 Gs to 1 G. 1 G is what you're experiencing right now. So 0.8 is where there's a drop in G-force where you kind of feel a little bit lighter, like, ooh, the plane goes down a little bit and you feel kind of like you're floating for a split second. So typical turbulence ranges between 0.8 to 1 G. That's the same amount of G-force that you experience while riding an elevator. Okay, so very, very low. Um, even in severe turbulence, so like the most severe turbulence ranges between 0.4 Gs up to 1.6 Gs, well below the force needed to cause concussion. So even if you're kind of bouncing around on the plane, you're not experiencing enough force to cause concussion injury or subsequent concussion injury. So you don't have to worry about that. The only time you could theoretically get a concussion is if the, if you swung and boom, smacked your head off something else. Like you bang head with your neighbor or you don't have your seatbelt on, you fly up and hit the, hit the overhead. Um, or bags fall out of the overhead and, and smack you. Those are the only possible ways that you're going to get um, a subsequent concussion on a flight. So in summary, it seems from what we know now that air travel is safe for patients with concussions and it will not affect your recovery from concussion, as far as we know anyway, uh, unless it's in the very, very acute stages following injury. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Just one more thing before you go. This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Clinical Network. Are you suffering from concussion symptoms that just aren't getting better? Maybe you're in the wrong place. 
maybe you're seeing the wrong healthcare professional. Visit completeconcussion.com slash find dash a dash clinic to find all the local professionally trained concussion rehab individuals in your area. Each of our partnered clinics have gone through extensive training on concussion assessment, management, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation. Uh, they're gonna work with you to try and find the root cause of your symptoms and then develop a treatment plan and approach to help get rid of them. If you don't know what's driving the symptoms, you can't ever help or hope to fix them. Completeconcussions.com slash find a clinic. They have a 98% patient satisfaction rating and have a higher net promoter score than Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. Completeconcussions.com slash find a clinic. You will not regret it.